the church, let's stand to our feet and worship. Are you ready to sing this morning? Are you ready to sing this morning? Worship our God. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. And I raise a to sing and praise our God. No matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you came in here with, let's just commit to sing a little bit louder, to worship a little bit more, to give him everything that we have. So let's sing together. And sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. 
Hey, we lifted up our hallelujah. Now we're going to do a thousand more hallelujahs. We've got a new song. It's called A Thousand Hallelujahs. Aiden, we sing a thousand and hallelujah a lot. Yes, we do. Because we can't give them enough. We cannot give our Lord praise that can match who he actually is. So we're just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And I hope that you know that there is an infinite amount of our God to be had. So come and, and experience him today. As we sing this song, A Thousand Hallelujahs, we're just going to talk about through this song how no one else is worth the praise more than Jesus. Who else? That phrase, who else? Who could? Nobody. Nothing surpasses Jesus. Nothing comes close to knowing him. So we're going to sing this one for you. Once you know it, sing with us.
praise the Lord. Hey, I want, on the count of three, before you sit down, on the count of three, I want you to say praise the Lord with me. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. You guys can be seated for just a minute. Jesus is king. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you something. We live in a world where we hear all the time how bad it is out there. We hear how awful it is and how terrible it is and how dark it is. And yeah, there's a level, a level of truth to that. But don't live outside of the promise of God. Amen? Amen? This is what his word says in Psalm 33, 4 and 5. It says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Don't mishear me today. I'm not going to tell you that bad things are good. But what I am going to tell you is that the goodness of God is not out of reach. That his unfailing love is not unattainable. It's not unreachable. It is unearnable. It's his grace that's poured out in us. It's full of his unfailing love. And the reality is all we have to do is walk in it. It doesn't mean we won't experience sadness, that we won't experience hurt or brokenness. It doesn't mean we won't experience failure, but it does mean that we will walk in unfailing love. If you're a guest with us today, that's all you needed to know about the Orchard Church. And if you're here and you're a part of the Orchard Church, it's great to be reminded of it. That's what we're about, walking in the unfailing love of Jesus Christ. He is just that good. If you're a guest watching online or in person, there's a digital connection card. There's one, and I'm supposed to go through all that every Sunday. Look, I'm just going to say this. Please fill it out and put it in the offering box on the way out. Good? We good? If you would do that, that'd be awesome. I want to be busy about the Father's business today. And we want to follow up with you if you're a guest so that we can answer any questions you have and help get you plugged in and whatever season of life you're in. And if you've been here for a while and you've been you've been kind of on the fence about whether to commit or not, today you're going to know whether or not you want to commit to this church. We promise you that. I'm also going to ask you to con continue to commit with your giving financially because we are, look, at, look around you. How full is this room? It's full. Should have been in the first service. Look, some of you think, I might try out the 915. That's fine, do that. But they're both full. We got to make some decisions. We got some things to do. And if we're planning for the future, that means we're planning with you in mind. So committing to be a part and give that which God has given you will make all the difference. Well, maybe not all, but a lot. And we would appreciate it greatly. But let me tell you something. Our mission is to be the church to the community. Our purpose, our purpose statement as a church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's happening. Listen, I'm about to get excited. Let me tell you something. This is what happened. This is what happened, not what happened. This is what happened. You know it's serious when you start cutting out vowels and consonants. <laughs> Listen, y'all didn't know I was going to get so excited, did you? Hayden's like, oh, no, he's out of control. <laughs> okay, somebody roll this guy back in. Let me tell you something. About six months ago, there was a lady who was going through a tough time, just a tough season in life. And she was hopeless, she was hurting, and she did not know what was going to happen with her. She had experimented, tried to find hope and joy and peace in a lot of different ways. She was a teacher at a local school. Two teachers who go to this church were the light of Christ in their school. And they saw the darkness and they saw the hurting of this woman. And so they went to her and said, listen, we, no pressure. We just want to invite you to come and experience what it's like to be a part of a kingdom community. What it's, part, what, it, what it's like to be a part of a church and see what this Jesus is really all about. And so guess what? She came. She came about six months ago. And she came one Sunday and she was really intrigued by that. And then she came back the next week. And if... I have all the details correctly. It was the next week she walks down here at the end of the service. By the way, I remember preaching that Sunday, and it had nothing to do specifically with a gospel call, but it was about who Jesus is and his character. And she came down and she said, I want to give my life to that Jesus. And so this woman gave her life to Jesus Christ. And for six months she's been, to, yeah, come on. Yeah, somebody, yeah, come on. That's what we're about. Listen. For six months, for about six months, she was in discipleship and growing. She continues to be discipled actively. It hadn't been all sunshine and rainbows since she gave her life to Christ, but she has committed to the walk. She's committed to the journey. Today, we're going to baptize her. 
Oh, it gets better, though. It gets better. It gets better. You're going to have to listen to two sermons today. Listen, it gets better. Because Thursday afternoon, she came in to meet with Pastor Justin to talk about baptism today. And her mom from Cincinnati, Ohio, is down for the month. She brought her mom with her. Because of Laura's influence on her mom, Miss Norma here gave her life to Jesus on Thursday afternoon. Now, that's what we're about, church. That's what we're about. That's what we're supposed to be about. It's seeing lives transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, but in our faithfulness to talk about Him. And man, I'm so thankful for those two teachers. And I'm so thankful for each of you who continue to be the light in your community. Remember our mission, to be the church to the community. Miss Laura, come on, you can start making your way. As she does, she makes her way into the, the baptistry, baptismal pool, whatever you want to call that thing. It's where we dunk you. <laughs> I want you to know that um, anybody else that would be here today to say, you know what, I haven't been bapti- baptized or I have, and I just don't remember it or whatever, and I want to be baptized, we can take care of that. I don't have clothes. Yeah, you do. We have clothes for you. We're already prepared for that. But also, as we were sitting there Thursday, she said something when she was talking to her mom about her new relationship with Jesus. And I said, can you say that again? Can you say that again? And she said, absolutely. And this is what she said. No matter where, who I've known, no matter what I've owned, no matter where I've traveled, no matter what I've done or accomplished or earned, nothing, nothing compares to the fact that I now know Jesus. And Jesus loves me and I love him. He died for me and I'm living for him. She said he died for me and I'm living for him. (laughs) If you needed a profession of faith, that's one right there. And we're going to see this through baptism. This, notice, we said she gave her life to Jesus six months ago. So baptism is not salvation, but it is a demonstration of salvation. It's showing, hey, this is, this is what's already happened to me. And so in just a moment, for those of you who might not know about baptism, what it is is in a moment when we take Miss Laura under the water, when I take her under the water, it is her voluntarily dying to herself and saying, you know what, I'm done. I'm done trying to earn it. I'm done trying to figure it out. I know that I can't. I'm surrendering, and I am dying the same death that Christ died on the cross. And then when she comes back up, she's coming back up resurrected with the newness of Christ. She's not, gonna, she's not the same Laura that she was six months ago. She's new. And let me tell you something. If you knew Laura before and you know Laura now, I've heard people who knew her say she's a different person. And it's a beautiful story. Laura, I know you wanted to say something, so take off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I I just, I failed public speaking in college. And uh, I don't like public speaking, but that's why I became a teacher of children, because I can talk with children better than adults. But this is God talking through me. This This is no longer me, my ego, my fear, my... God has taken a hold of me. And like Pastor Stephen said, the first three months of 2022, I just, I went through such a dark, dark time and I was ready to just give up. I was ready to be homeless if I needed to. I left a teaching job of 15 years. Jenna was there and she was the Lord himself. You know, just, she kept showing up in my classroom giving me posters and treats and chocolates. And I said, are you paid to be my mentor? And she said, no. And I realized it was God working through her. Just never took any, you know, um, accolades for it. But anyway, what I want to say is that I stopped my life. I stopped moving. I stopped searching. I stopped looking for that link, that missing link that had been missing for 60 years, 60 years. I, like I said in the video, I, I searched, I bought things, I 
it was money. It was, you should have seen the way I looked. I was 100 pounds lighter, and it was all for the image. I just wanted to look good for everybody. And I realized it, it was empty. Always, always, I kept coming up short. And then at the first quarter of this year, when I became so depressed and suicidal, he talked to me for the first time in my life. And he, it was, I, I, a year ago, with all this church stuff, I wouldn't have walked away. I would have run too churchy. But I get it now. I get it now. He, he took hold of me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Laura, it is with great joy and incredible privilege that now as my sister in Christ, because of your profession of faith and your obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Yahweh God, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Go ahead and stay on your feet as we continue in worship. to the cross you crucified all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find my reason for living so let my life become an offering to the one who invite you to just lift your hands up and lay it all down to Jesus. He's worthy. He's worth whatever you can give him. So let's give it to him right now. Don't hold back. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now. It's for surrender this morning, church. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down for you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life now is for you.
Jesus, we have come to lift our hands up and lay our lives down to you. Amen. Amen. Listen, the reason that we can come to him is because of what he did for us on the cross. It's because that he no longer allowed for death to be the final word spoken over us. That because of him and his love and his grace and his mercy, he bore our punishment, our shame, our sin, died the death that we deserve so that we might live in the righteousness of God, so that we might have him. And I want to tell you that Jesus is worth more than anything. So let's praise him for how he arrested death this morning. Without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Let me hear you, oh your grace Oh your grace
For doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. We owe all to you, Jesus. You are no, you are deserve nothing short than our whole selves. Help us look more like you today, Jesus. Help us see you. Transform us with your word. Continue to move in power. And help us to dive deep into truth and not feeling this morning. Help us just know who you are better so that we can know how to live and how to just fulfill who you've made us to be, which is your son and your daughter. We pray and ask and declare all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, folks. So I've got the privilege and opportunity to introduce to you who, someone who has become a dear friend in a short amount of time, Pastor Tim Owens. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Pastor Tim was with us just a few weeks ago. Um, and talk to us a little bit about what God is doing in the Northeast in church planning and church revitalization and things like that. But I got to tell you, um, over our time together and having visited, spent time together, I, I told the first service, man, it's like I, I found a brother that I always had but never knew existed. And there was just such a, a kindred spirit and um, a, just a true spiritual brotherhood and love between the two of us just in a just in a short amount of time. And as we continue to share and talk, um, he has a great vision for the unity of the church, the health of the church. And, and that is not just exemplified through what he says, but it's also exemplified through the impact that the church for which he provides leadership for in Vermont is having. Multi-site uh, campuses and, and church planting. And, and so the Lord has really blessed him. He's also blessed him in the area of communication. And so I found out he was gonna be in town this week and I said, man, can I get you? So come on, Pastor Tim. And I'm looking forward to this message as you share with us as a church so we can be strengthened and even more unified. Amen. What's up, Orchard? Hey. Hey. Right. got to do something first. It's good, honey. My pant leg is down. Turn the mic on. You said, oh, sorry, just turn the mic on. I'm really kidding. Can you hear me now? I'm on. This is good? Still ain't on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. My wife said, make sure you check your pants before you get on stage. And I was hoping she was talking about down here. Because I'd been standing down there for a few minutes. I'm thinking, uh, excuse me? Um, I told her that's the look I was going for. This is what hipster looks like right here. And uh, she didn't have it. I, I'm, I'm so excited. Let me just tell you about my family really quick because I love them. My bride of 28 years and been together 31 years. Danielle, right over here, raise your, raise your hand. Up high where they can see it, baby. Oh, there you go. There you go. And then my two boys, I've got Gavin, who is my creative kind of worship. He, he is over all of our creative at our church, both locations, and just a gifted, anointed little worship leader and, and just a man of God and uh, motorcycle riding freak like his daddy. And, um, and then my Garrett, 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 you may got a, you may got a son or a daughter that just likes to hit things. Uh, Garrett's just a kid that likes to hit things. He, just, he's, he plays the drums, but he really doesn't play the drums. He just beats the, he's bam, bam. He's bam, bam. And Garrett is uh, 16 and uh, just, uh, just uh, an unbelievable young man and just strong and likes to do, you know, he, I don't think he knows his own. He's like me. He doesn't know my own strength. And, uh, and um, he just, uh, just a blessing. And then we got two of our favorite people in the world, Jay and Stacy Smith. Raise your hands right here. Jay's one of our elders at Mission City and also a.k.a. travel the country with the pastor. That's, that's the second calling. Uh, it's to travel the country with a pastor. And so Jay and I go everywhere together from Nepal to Orchard Church. And a minute ago, he made a good point. I was eating my apple, and I was afraid. I was eating my apple. And he said, listen, if you can't eat your apple at Orchard Church, where can you eat your apple? <laughs> I said, praise the Lord. Matter of fact, I think I could probably walk off the hill and get an apple, right? Can somebody show me where I can get a good apple? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, man, I'm excited to be with you. Some of you I've known for a long time, the Woodles and just others, Mark, you guys, I've just known some of you guys for a long time. Your drummer this morning, I was his student pastor in high school, and hit, not my high school, but in his high school days. Uh, we used to go to Shoney's when Shoney's was really Shoney's back out on the bypass, Shoney's, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we went to the new Shoney's, but I didn't eat Shoney's like it was Shoney's back then. And, uh, and we used to go there every week, and I'd hung out with a group of teenagers, and just such a blessing to come back to, to North Carolina, to Haywood County. We love this place. 
We, this, this is not home anymore for us. We are New Englanders. We love New England. If the Lord let us, we'll stay in New England forever. We love it. Uh, and uh, even though it's a very spiritually dark place, the light of the gospel is changing the story. Amen. Let me say another thing here this morning. This is the rowdy crowd at the Orchard Church. I like the rowdy crowd. Can we do a little homework? Can we have a little homework this morning? It's okay, a little, little, little housekeeping rules. I am one of those brothers that like people to talk to him while he's preaching. So if you get quiet, I start thinking you ain't with me. So somewhere along the way, I need someone to say, come on, all right, amen, way to go. Get on with it, bald man. Whatever you need to say, I need to hear it. You know what I'm saying? Amen. So let's do a little, like Mark. Thank you, Mark. I heard that voice a minute ago. Like, like, I just need some, like, if I say Jesus is king, you're supposed to say, amen. yes, yes. And, and if I don't hear you, here's the, here's, the, here's the punchline. If I don't hear you coming on, because I know it's a good point, not because I said it, because God's word said it. I know, I'm going to say this and just know it's coming. Come on, somebody. Let's say something. Because if this was Pisgah, Tuscola, y'all be screaming right now. Now, I went to Pisgah, and I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, but we, we, we won again. Anyhow, so I just want to throw it out there. Um, I know, I know, unity in the body. I'm trying to cause discord to show them how we come back together to, to unite. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, turn there in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, you should. And if you don't, I guarantee this great church will make sure you get a Bible. Because we know that the most important thing you can have is the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path, which is the Word of God. It is not something to own. It is something out of necessity that you need. The Word of God is alive and living and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it needs to cut some of us and do surgery and fix some of our craziness. Come on, somebody. That's a good moment right there. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, we see this beautiful picture. Now, let me tell you a little bit about me. I've been uh, in ministry 31 years. I, I started in ministry when I was young, and I came to know the Lord very young at Nineveh Baptist Church. Nineveh Baptist Church, I came to know the Lord and I met my wife, because that's the only place her daddy would let us go date. And I got Jesus and a hot wife right there in the same spot. Amen. And, uh, and it was three months after I gave my life to Christ that I came into ministry. Literally, no. And I've had people say, well, man, you should be, you were young. Listen, I didn't call myself into ministry. God did. And so if he decided to do it three months after I got saved, then that's up to him. He's king, not me. Nor the dude asking me and questioning my calling. And so I gave my life to Christ, and I've been in the church ever since, and I've had a great privilege of serving seven years and helping start Pinnacle Church over in Canton, and just amazing movement of God, and I love our family there at Pinnacle. And uh, now I have had the great privilege of starting uh, what is known now as Mission City Church. We're a multi-site church. We have two locations in two different directions, an hour apart from each other. And uh, in Vermont, about 450, 500 people call our church home and in Vermont, that's unusually crazy because most churches in New England are 20 to 30 people. And so God's allowing us to see a movement of God take place where now, you heard me say this last week, we got all kinds of things going on. We're raising up leaders. We are a leadership development church because we believe that discipleship is not just fellowship, but it is also leadership. And that what the church is missing today is leaders. What makes the church unhealthy today is leaders with vision. And that's why in the midst of a pandemic, this church is growing because you have a leader with a vision. Come on, somebody. And so over the last little bit, I have always struggled with my weight, but over the last little bit, I got super serious this year. The Holy Spirit just really spoke to me at the beginning of the year, and he just said to me, uh, I've got four things I want you to commit to this year, and one of them was, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You should honor me with your body. And so I decided it's time for me to quit playing around and start getting on this game serious. And so over the last few months, I've worked very hard, and I'm super working hard. While all of my great friends and family last night ate Chick-fil-A ice cream, I sat there with my hands crossed saying bad things about them in my head and um, watching them eat ice cream. But I just choose not to, and over the last few months, I've lost over 40 pounds. I, listen, amen. Uh, I got rid of my diabetes. I had diabetes and I got rid of that. And uh, now I'm working on some other things and I just want to be healthy because here's what I've learned. If I'm going to be a part of a movement of God, there are benefits to being healthy in that. Yeah. Let me tell you some of the benefits of being healthy that I've learned. Like here's one of the benefits of being healthy. You can go to a regular department store and buy a shirt and it will fit you. <laughs> it's a benefit. I can go to Target. I almost cried when I went to Eddie Bauer and the shirt fit me. 
I was so excited. That may seem funny to some, but that's true to me. Like, I had to go to the store called Big and Tall. You know why it's Big and Tall? It's because it declares it to the whole world. And as we walk in, I want you to know this is for people who are large in life. And I had to go there, but I don't have to go there anymore. And benefit of being healthy is I no longer have to worry about taking medicine to control my sugar. Now I can just push away from the table. And instead of eating a muffin during the service, I ate an apple. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just trying to live healthy because there are benefits to being healthy. I want to live a long life. I've made my mind up. It would be great for me to know no one else is going to be the husband of my wife but me. And so if I don't watch my health, then I'm going to die and somebody else will enjoy the beauty. So I've just made my mind up. There are benefits to being healthy. As a church planting catalyst with the North American Mission Board, full time now, one of the things I've learned is there are also greater benefits for a church being healthy. We have for too long judged church a success by how many people we get into a room. But here's the fact of the matter. We are seeing over the last few decades a lot of large churches that weren't healthy that now are crumbling. So just because you got a stack of people in the room don't mean you're healthy. What will really define whether you are a healthy church will not be seating capacity, but it will be sending capacity. How many people you're sending out of here? Never has it been God's desire that the church of Jesus stick themselves in one building and try to get as large as they can and fit as many people as they can. The gospel and the message and the mission of Jesus has always been come and see and then please, for the love of the mission, go and tell. And so we want you to know that as Pastor Stephen and I have talked in a short time, his desire is that some of you will leave here one day, but only to go on mission for Jesus. Hopefully maybe to plant some churches. It's the number one way to reach the world with the gospel is to plant a church. It's the number one way. You can debate me if you want, but it's the truth. So in Ephesians chapter 4, we see Paul give a clear, beautiful picture of what it looks like to be a healthy church. Now, all you rowdy cats, are y'all ready for the word this morning? Amen. Let's jump in. Ephesians chapter 4 is so good. Here we go. The first word there is the word. By the way, let me stop. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm about to get so excited about preaching. We stood for 20 minutes to sing songs to celebrate the song and the Jesus of the song. But now let's stand in honor of God's word because it's important. I'm going to try to make this painless for you. But we're going to stand and read his word. Therefore... The Bible says, therefore I. If you see the word therefore in the Bible, take highlight notice. It's there for a It's there for a reason. If you go right above, Paul just begins to elaborate on how good God loves you. And he's praying this beautiful prayer over the body. There's a God who loves you. And my heart's desire, Paul said, is that you understand his love for you so much how wide and how deep and how wide and how big his love is for you. And that not even you understand how much he loves you, but how powerful he is because he's a God that can do immeasurably more than you could ever think or ask to imagine in Christ Jesus if you will just be obedient to that. So because of that, I want you to understand because of who God is, his love for me, his generosity to me, his grace for me, he is offering me a way where there was no way because of how big and vast he is and how mighty he is, I am a prisoner. I am a prisoner of the Lord. Verse 2, don't miss this. He says, I am a prisoner. I, I'm in verse 1, my second part. I urge you to live worthy, don't, li don't miss this word, worthy of the calling uh, you have received. I want you to understand that the salvation that you and I declare as being who we are is a gift from God. That lordship in Jesus is not something we should be regretting or, or, or being fearful of. Or We should understand that God has given us a gift. He's given us a Lord who has a kingdom and he has standards and he has a will and a desire. And not only has he gifted us with Jesus, but he's gifted us with gifts to use for Jesus. This is healthy church. He goes on to say, he said, you need to walk worthy of the calling you received with all humility, gentleness, and patience. How many of you right now would fail the test with almost every one of those? I'm not that gentle. I'm not that patient, right? And I'm not always that humble. How many of you know that if you don't fear humility, you will become I fear pride, you will become prideful. Then he goes on, he said, with patience, bearing one another in love. You know what Paul's saying? Just get along, people. 
We're all messed up in this building. I don't know if you know this, but the moment one of us showed up here this morning, had it not been for the grace of God, we are a broken, corrupt, crazy, jacked up group of people. And you leave us alone long enough on our own, we will drive our car into a ditch and then stay in the ditch because we think that now is where the road is supposed to be taking us, like this. Right? Come on, somebody. How many of you are in tune with your brokenness? And we are broken people, and we know that we need the Holy Spirit to allow us to stay humble, gentle, and patient with each other so we can bear one another. Because I want you to look around with all these people in the room. I can guarantee you one thing after 31 years of being in the church. We're going to get on each other's nerves. I've already gotten on some of your nerves since I started. He's too loud. He spit on me just a minute ago. I felt it. He's joking on stage. It's funny how people say, you're not supposed to joke on stage. Well, where am I supposed to joke? This is not supposed to be a boring place. You want to go to boring church? Then let's send you there. We want to go to, we want to be there. We want to, we want to sing about life and speak about life and enjoy fun time together. And so anyhow, he goes on to say in verse 4, there is one spirit, one, one body, one spirit, just as you were called, one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, above all, through all, and in all. You know what he's saying right there? He's saying that God is everything and I'm telling you something we and churches say a a thousand hallelujahs to that but when it comes to letting him be Lord of our life we're like and Paul's saying that, that that he is Lord that Jesus is Lord he is king he is in control this is his mission I am his slave I'm under arrest and I'm under his authority and whatever he says I will do because he's above all in all he is everything he's accomplished everything he is the first the last the beginning and the end the same yesterday today and forever come on somebody say amen right there he is God y'all with me let's go and so anyhow we get to verse 5 one Lord one faith one baptism one God one father of all above all through all and in all now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ of Christ's gift for it is for it for it says in in Psalm 68 18 what is what he's quoting here when he ascended on high he took the captives captive aren't you glad that he came and took the captives captive they, they were captivated. We were captivated, and he did a good thing. He went by our captivators, and he took the captives captive, and he set us free. Amen. You don't have to worry about working with the guy who's got the key to the cell if you're the God of the universe. He just walked through a wall, opened a door, and let you out. Took the captives captive. That's what we got to hear right here, this story this morning. The captive's no longer captive anymore. Death's been arrested. Don't make me preach that. That's a good word. He said, goes on to say, but who, what does it he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens to fulfill all things. Not some things, but all things. And, and he himself gave some apostles. Those are the sent ones, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors. We're afraid of the first two. We actually have somewhat, some level, omitted the apostle or the at least apostolic ones in the church to say that no longer exists and that no longer is. And then those of us who have apostolic callings, I'm not saying I'm an apostle, do not hear me say that. If you choose to choose to believe that I said that, that's on you, not on me. I didn't say I was an apostle, but I did say that God has given me an apostolic calling. Do you understand this? And the apostolic calling is to be sent. So as a leader in my church, as the pastor of Mission City Church, they graciously let me move about because they understand the greatest gift and the greatest influence that I can make in the church is to be out front going into places where there are not churches, equipping leaders, strengthening the uh, broken things, uh, starting new things. And that's the best thing that I could do because if you lock me in a room, I'm like a bull in a china shop. I got some great elder pastors who are killing it this morning and, they're, and I'll tell people all the time, they are way better pastors than I am because that's their gift. But God's called me to have this apostolic calling and to move about and to go places. And I get the privilege through our mission board to go all over the country and to help and make awareness for the broken places and the, and, the, and the vacant places in this world to start new things. 
Some are apostles, some are prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And why do we have these gifted people in the church body? It's to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. The body of Christ as we know it today is weak, but God's desire is that this be the strongest force in the world. But the problem is we've become very irresistible, not sim- are very resistible, but not simply irresistible. And can I just say something, because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I feel like I need to say it. I should have said the last service, but I was worried about the time, because I knew that we were going to have people trying to get in a small parking lot, all these people. And, and I just got to be honest with you. Do you realize that today, statistically, there are massive amounts of people that are walking away from the church and have want nothing to do with the church? Can I tell you, that's not Jesus' fault. That's our fault. Because we have made the church resistible. But if we will walk in the lordship of Jesus and let King Jesus be king and us follow his will, let me tell you something. When Jesus is in the house, people hang out the window to hear the message and to get touched by him. Good to me. Side, side message. Sorry. I got to get to the real message because I'm going to have no time. Verse 13 until the, uh, verse, let's go to verse 12. Equip the saints to do the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until, verse 13, we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with stature measured by the Christ's fullness. When we fully look like Christ, that's when we'll know that we are measured up to the growth that God desires for us. Verse 14, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness when the pandemic hits our world and everybody starts hollering truth truth follow this listen to this we'll understand that what thus saith the lord is the standard period by human cunning cleverness and techniques of deceit but speaking the truth in love there's one we should listen to today let us grow up in every way into him who is the head christ for him the whole body is fitted and knitted together that's you missionaries to a people on behalf of a king with a message by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. You can be seated. You can be seated. I want to give you three marks of a healthy church. I believe on the precipice of your rally, next weekend's rally, leadership rally, right? Is this, what are you calling it? It's leadership rally. I believe this whole space, right? I'm going to put you on the spot. Come to the leadership rally. Don't even say, well, I got, you you ain't got nothing more important than being at the leadership rally to get your marching orders to be strengthened as a body so you can accomplish the mission of God that God has placed in this moment for this body, which, by the way, is unique and rare. But I want to tell you in the midst of that, beginning before you get there, that the one thing that you should shoot for is not growth. Growth is not your business, nor is it my business. If you read the book of Acts, their business was obedience and doing the will of the Father. And the Bible says when they did that, then the Lord added to the church daily those who should be saved. His math and his multiplication is way more better than ours. There's some good old English right there for you. For the teachers in the house. There you go, sister. i just let you know I was the one that let my teacher down a lot. Way more better. (laughs) Let me give you three marks of a healthy church. Number one is this. A healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. It is important for us to understand how Paul started this section of Scripture out. What he said is, I am Paul, I am a prisoner. What he is really saying, and if you look in in the Greek here and you understand what the word means prisoner, he means I have been arrested and I'm under someone else's authority. Come on, somebody, that's enough. You ought to get the point right there. You've been arrested. You've been taken captive. You were a captive who was captive, and someone else took you captive and then set you free, but not for you to just do what you want, now for you to be under the authority of the one who set you free. I've never met someone who has had someone rescue them from death and not be thankful for it and say the words, I will forever be indebted to you because you rescued me while I was about to be dead. You saved me, and I will always forever be indebted to you why in the world we don't treat God this way that you rescued me I was dead in my trespasses and sin I was bound and on my way to be separated from you for eternity and in your grace and mercy you sent Jesus to die for me and now I am under arrest and under the authority and lordship of you and for the rest of my days to the best of my ability whatever you want I want to do that
And I want you to understand what Paul's talking about here is the gift of Jesus and him being Lord. The greatest gift that people like you and me ever got is someone who could really be in control and it really make a difference because if we're in control, you're in control. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. This is a great movement of God, but the moment that you as people in the body of Christ here think that you get in control, this thing is destined for a downward spiral quickly. You ought to get in your meetings, you ought to get in your places, your committees, whatever you got, and you ought to get in there and say, man, we could talk about a million things, but what does King Jesus want us to do? And whatever he says, we will do that, not because that's the token answer. No, 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 because that is what people who are under arrest and under authority do. They listen to the one who is in control, and they follow what he says. And a true, healthy church is spiritually healthy in their unity spiritually together. People say, well, what defines your church? Jesus is king. Like, I mean, tell me about your worship. Oh, it's about Jesus is king. What about Pastor Stephen's preaching? I mean, isn't he a great work? You know, can he just speak? No, no, his message is about Jesus is king. Why are you giving these hot dogs away? Because we want people to know Jesus is king. Come on, somebody. Oscar Mayer can point to Jesus is king. Right on. We've made a mind up at our church. We don't care what we're going to do. If we go downtown and hand out marshmallows, it's going to be because we want to point people to Jesus as king. The church is not about my name, knowing my nature, built around my uh, personality. Listen, no longer. I don't want people to know my name. I don't even want them to know Mission City's name. I want them to know his name. And now as a body, we are unified together to believe everything we do is about making known Jesus as king. And this, by the way, is being thrown out in the church today. And if you want to know why most churches aren't surviving and thriving, it's because someone else is king. And then it's like, man, what do you guys want to do? Well, let's get together and decide. Do you realize that's the worst thing a group of people could do? What we should do is when we get into our meetings, just get together and listen. Wherever you lead, we'll go. Whatever you say, we'll do. We'll follow our king. I'm making this up as I'm going. (laughs) A healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. Look here. Don't miss this. I could go back and read all that, but I I want you just to hear what I'm about to say because I want you to see this, and there's so much here. I could speak for days on this. He's talking about we're under arrest in prison and authority of someone else. We need to walk worthy of this great gift and calling to make Jesus Lord. And we need to do it so that we can make Jesus not only Lord but famous to the world. And know that we need to do this with humility. What does that mean? What does humility mean? It means I live in such a way that my words don't have to say it. That my life says it first that everything I do is about Jesus. I walk with humility and gentleness. That means that when we see other believers who say they're believers freaking out and saying hurtful, harmful things and and telling me things like, well, I'm just that guy that's in your face. Well, the problem with that is that the king did not command you to get in someone's face. The king commanded you to get on your face and hear from him and to be loving for him and to show the world the love of God through you to them. And he didn't call you to get in anybody's face. If anybody's going to get in anybody's face, let the spirit of the king get in someone's face and convict them. With gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, That's why when Pastor Stephen has to bring a few of you into his office because y'all can't get along, here's the best way I've done it in our church. And these guys will testify this. When we see that happen in our church, this is my spiritual gift that I do. Would you guys just stop it? Right? Y'all fuss and stop it. Y'all to be ashamed of yourself. Stop it. You're grown adults. Come on, somebody. There'd be more people in this county leave somewhere because someone didn't say what they wanted them to say. And at the end of the deal, how many of you have always heard things you didn't want to say, you want people to say? Most of you dudes in the room heard this all the time. You want to go on a date? No. (laughs) You think this is a good-looking shirt, honey? No. It's got a grease stain on it. That's not a polka dot. 
We just got to get bare with one another in love and make every effort. Listen, this word making every effort, this idea here is to be zealous about keeping unity. You know what you guys ought to do? I'm just not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you this is what I think you should do. You know what you should do as a church? Well, here's what you should do. If anyone, anybody wants to cause you disunity in this body, they either got to change it or they got to leave. Period. Well, we can't do that. Why not? You know, we're the only organization in the world. You do that at Chick-fil-A and you won't get a job and you won't be there long. Well, this ain't Chick-fil-A. I get it. I get it. I wish it was right now because I like a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Not today. Not today. But what I'm saying, do you understand what I'm saying? We've just made our mind up. We have this, we have this standard in our church because we want to be unified. If you can't Get on board with making Jesus king and us doing what he wants. We love you. We're thankful for you. But you either got to understand this is who we are or this is who we're, you're going to have to go find. We're going to help you. But this is, and we've had many people, but we've just made our mind up. If it hurts the body, we're not going to be a part of it. Because we want to be a part of the mission of God and the movement of God. And I'm telling you something, the one thing that will destroy that is disunity. And the one thing that will keep you unified is if everybody in this room decides it's always going to be about Jesus as king. Come on, somebody, right? And we just need to be that way all the time, under, in, in, united in our calling that Jesus is king, united in our conduct that we should look like the king that is Jesus, and united in our confession that his message, it's the way, the truth, and life. No man can come to the Father but by him. And if you want to follow Jesus, you may think it's going to be easy and he's going to give you happy hops to heaven, but I want you to understand, to come to Jesus means to die and to live your life, but he will be king and he will use you and he will, and he will provide for you because he is king. Number two, I want you to see this really quick. Number two is the health of the church is marked by not only unity, by, but by diversity. How many of you are thankful that we're all not the same? Amen. You'll be thankful that not every one of us are like this guy. Because everybody would come in this room like this. Hey! hey! It's what you... Everybody would be like, why are you yelling? I don't know. I'm just glad to be here. This young girl right here, I don't know her name. Is she, is she in this room right now? The young girl that led worship right here, she's out there. Anyhow, she, they should be in here listening to preaching right now. That's what should be happening. No, I'm just playing. But this young girl, <laughs> she seems to be, and I may have this, she may be the loudest person. She seems to be very meek and just, just, I see the Lord all over this young girl. And I just was sitting down there. I'm, I was a worship leader for many years. Some of you know this. And uh, I love worship leaders, and I just see the Lord all over her. And I know Hayden, the Lord's all over him. But we should be thankful that we are diverse Paul said there was grace given to us. Now there is saving grace. That means that we got what we didn't deserve instead of what we did. There's a way made for us where there seemed to be no way. And now we can be restored back to the Father in relationship with the Father. And Jesus, in God's gracious gift, graciously gave us Jesus. And we have a way now back to God that we didn't once have. That's saving grace. But this is here is ministerial grace. It means that he not only gave us saving grace, but he gave us ministry grace. He gave us a grace to do ministry, this gift. What he's saying here is that we have a God who is so gracious and generous that he not only saved us, but he wants to use us. Right. How many of you know anybody wants to use a broken toy? It's what I am. I'm a broken toy. But in God's grace, he fixed me and now wants to use me in spite of knowing how broken I was. He lets me preach on this stage, and if you know my story, this is not normal. I was a kid who never could graduate from high school, told by my principal. And now I'm standing in front, in front of a bunch of people, and I'm doing exactly opposite of what they said because he's king and they're not. Come on. Grace was given to each one of us. According to the measure of Christ's gift, for it says he ascended on high and he also took the captives captives. Now we can go back and read all that, but what you know is God, through Jesus, did everything that he needed to do to make all the right wrong and to make a way for us, right? right. And then he gifted us, and he not only gifted us, but he also gave us gifts. So there's two different levels here. There's the gift to the church, and then there's the gifts in the church. The gift to the church are the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. The gifts in the church are the ligaments, and I don't know, they're all over the place. And I want you to hear what I'm about to say because I don't want to freak you out. But if I could poke you a little bit, I would. 
How many of you really believe that we have got it all figured out when it comes to the Bible? Good. How many of you believe that there'll be some things that will wash out in the end and we'll realize, man, I was wrong on that, but that's, I had people all the time say, man, when I get to heaven, I'll find out this answer. Can I just tell you something? When I get to heaven, I ain't going to care about that answer. I'm just going to worship Jesus. Amen. I'm not going to go, hey, before we start singing, <laughs> Paul, I need to ask a question. What exactly was the thorn in the flesh? I'm not going to worry about that. There are two, two, two areas of diversity I want you to see according to the scripture. Number one is this, we are diverse in our gifts. These are the gifts to the body. These are the gifts to the church. Number one is the apostle. Now we believe here he's talking about the 12. But I also believe that there are still gifted men who have apostolic callings in their life. They are the sent out ones. They still have leadership in the church, over the church, but they also are sent out by the church to go and to begin to go to, to new places and to begin to get out front, work with those who are struggling and help encourage leaders and strengthen leaders and raise up leaders and pastor pastors and care for leaders. That's the, that's the apostolic leader. And it took me a long time to finally be able to stand before a crowd of people today and not really care because I'm confident in who I am in Christ that I know that my calling is is very apostolic. I always think about the big C church more than I do just the local body. That's why I'll get on a, my truck, drive 900 miles back to Vermont, spend about six hours at my house, go back to the airport, spend the night, get up the next morning on Saturday this coming week and go to the Dominican and spend time for a week equipping leaders and church planters and working with our church plant because I know that the best gift I can give to the body is to walk in my apostolic calling so that the mission of the church, the broad work of the church keeps getting done and I will continue to find Titus's, like he says, Paul tells Titus in, 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 his, in, his, in his writings that I'm going to leave you behind to establish elders in all these churches while I'm out here continually going to reach the broken and forgotten places. Amen. The problem with the church today, hear me say this, is that the role of the pastor is twofold. His role is to do everything for everyone all the time. Counselor, cook, director, Right? Come on, somebody. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Visit everybody, check on everybody, touch everybody, sing to everybody, all this stuff. And then we treat the pastor like he's a possession, not a gift. Your pastors are not possessions. Better yet, don't want to hurt your feelings. You might have hired them, but they don't belong to you. They are called men of God, not called people of God. And so your pastor is a gift to you and the gifts that he has is even a greater gift to you. And can I just tell you something? I spent a short time with your pastor, but what really united us is one conversation over some eggs. Good eggs. And I was saying bad things about y'all eating them biscuits at the buttered biscuit. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me get... I almost spoke in tongues when I just thought of those. <laughs> don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. And I'm not trying to freak you out. I'm going to tell you a couple things I feel like the Lord wants me to say. And if I don't get invited back, it's okay. I believe you have a pastor who has an apostolic calling. Amen. And I think you ought to make it really easy for him to walk in that calling. Because can I speak on behalf of a pastor? Our biggest fear in everything we do, honestly, he can tell you different, but I'm telling you, I know how we, I've been doing this 31 years. We don't want to let you down. We love you so much, we don't want to hurt you. We want to be here for you, but we realize quickly, do you realize that Pastor Stephen really can't pastor all these people in this one section by himself? But he can make sure that you get pastored while he is also making sure that the broad mission of this church is going out to the nations. Right. And so you may see him in the days ahead coming and going and doing. And Don't get upset because he may not be the one speaking every week. Listen, I've listened to a bunch of your preachers. They're all good. And if God allows it, there'll be more. And maybe you have 6, 8, 10, 12 guys speaking here. And maybe one of them better than him. I've got a crowd of speakers. I've got seven pastors who can bring it. When I leave, I'm like, man, they're so much better off with that guy preaching than me. 
And I want you to know something. I'm not saying you're pastors apostles. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there are apostolic callings that are still active in the church today, and the church should not run from them. They should consider them a gift, and they should say, Pastor, we want you to walk in that calling as you lead us in this mission. Yes. Did you get that say amen? amen? Some of you are like, I'm not sure. Well, you will keep reading. <laughs> then there's the prophet. Prophet is the guy who normally preaches, and you go, did that cat just say that? Oh, man. Because God gives that prophet a bold word, a truth. He exposes sin. He speaks. And when he speaks, it's so bold sometimes you convict it to your gut. You're like, man, you brought the heat, man. That's the way we like to explain it. But there's an anointing for that guy. That guy honestly can't be the guy preaching every week in a church because sometimes the body can't handle it. And they're like, oh, my gosh. But the prophet. And sometimes the prophet and the apostolic is together. So now you got a guy boldly speaking in places that he doesn't even know the people. And then you got the evangelist. How many of you know an evangelist? Somebody, you hear them, you're around them, and when they're sharing the gospel, you're like, I just want to talk to everybody about Jesus too. How many of you, Billy Graham's ministry, how many of you can turn YouTube on, hear two seconds of Billy Graham speak, and him say, come to Jesus? You know what I'm saying? How many of you immediately like, I want to go say that in my neighborhood right now? Because he's got this gift of evangelism. Man, Billy Graham could stand in a, in a, in a, in a, on a street in the middle of Manhattan, and I think half the people on the block would come to know Christ. It's just an anointing of evangelism. There's a difference in evangelism and evangelizing. Every one of y'all should be evangelizing. But some of you are called to be evangelists. Some of you got a gift of evangelism, man. You'll talk about Jesus. I don't care where it's at, anytime, place. I've got a young man that's one of my executive pastors, Mark Page. He's from Haywood County. And Mark, literally, we were at a children's conference in Atlanta. All these people there are believers. And I'm looking around, where is Mark? And Mark's trying to share the gospel with some of these children's pastors. And I was like, Mark, can I tell you something, bro? I know that not every one of us believe kids ministry people are believers. But I'm telling you something right now. These people are a Christian, man. Because he's got the gift of evangelism. You've got the pastor. These are the people that work. I'm going to tell you something. Can I just be honest with you? There is a rule in church growth that when you get to a place of 70% capacity, you should start another church or start another service. I think y'all need to do both. But I'm telling you right now, I want you to hear me say this. If you don't decide that we're going to multiply ourselves, you are going to decrease instead of increase because no one will sit on top of each other like they are right now forever. You've got a real issue, but it's a good issue. Get ready. We're going to have to go to some of y'all and say, you, gotta, you can't sit here anymore. <laughs> Ain't your seat in the first place. <laughs> this place belongs to the Lord, and so does that cushion you're sitting on. The Lord gave you a good seat to sit on for a minute, but maybe what the Lord wants you to do is get out of that seat and go sit somewhere else so you can reach other people. Amen. The evangelist, the pastor. What I was going to say is as soon as you begin to see yourself begin to multiply, Pastor Stephen will have a real big problem. He'll have to eventually put a campus pastor here that he leads because he'll have to make sure. And I just know this because we did it. We had to, our structure went crazy. And people are like, what do we got a lead team? We got a central team. We got a, but we are in two different locations and we just had a new pastor come to our campus. And now he's the pastor of that campus and other guys are pastors of the other campus. I'm the lead pastor of the church. And really I lead four guys and they lead everybody else. But guess what's happening? The gospel is going out and the mission of the church is, is advancing. Why? Because we are embracing our diversity. Yes, amen. And they're like, Pastor, you go. When you come back, tell us the stories. What would you see? What would you experience? Yesterday, can I tell you a story? Yesterday, I talked with two men. Their name are on the docket now. And both of these men want to go and they want to be sent out to plant new churches in New England. One of them's about to graduate from a seminary and the other guy just knows Jesus has called him and told me yesterday, he goes, you're not going to believe this, but God just put me in your path this week. That's why I came here. I said, I'm going to believe that because that's why I came here. And I get to go and see all these men being called out. Can I just say this in this room? Some of you in this room, God may want to call out to go plant a church somewhere. Stop playing around. Let's get it done. And, And by the way, some of you, you need to quit sitting and spectating and you need to be a part of this thing sell out and say, I'm going to be a part of this thing and quit watching and amen and on credit. You need to get in here and get your hands dirty and help, man, take the mission that God is using here at Orchard Church to the rest of this county and to the world. Yeah. All right, I got to finish. I got to finish because we got lunch at 1230 and we've got 15 minutes to get there. Come on. I feel so much more relaxed in this service. I think it's because you're here, Ron. I just feel relaxed. My brother Ron is here, and I've got Mark's amen. It sounds like he's screaming at me, but I love it. 
We should understand we are diverse in our gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. These are the gifts to the body. But we're also diverse in our giftings where we are in hospitality, in, in the group pas- uh, compassions and whatever else the gifts are. And then we are diverse in our responsibilities. I want you to understand something. Everyone is important, but everyone has their own responsibility. Amen, and by the way, can I just give you my own thought? Membership is important, but I want you to understand missionary uh, in, 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 in being a missionary is more important. Jesus, uh, God said through Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you're a new creation in Christ. Old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. And a lot of us like to stop and celebrate there. Woohoo! Amen! We're new in Christ. But you don't read the rest of the verse. And the rest of the verse says you have responsibility now as a believer. And here's your responsibility. You are ambassadors for Christ with a message and a mission of reconciliation. And you are to go to the world and compel the world to come to Jesus. And if you don't hold up your responsibility, whether or not you are new in Christ is almost not irrelevant. But it's almost weakened because you're not taking up your responsibility in Christ now as a missionary to the world with a message to a broken people. So don't just celebrate freedom, you celebrate enlistment. Okay, we got to finish. Number three, the musicians are coming. Somebody's going to come play this keyboard right here, and it's not going to be me. The good thing about having a worship leader in your family, like if no one ever comes, no one ever comes, you'd be like, hey, son, can you come grab this guitar, help a brother out? But we don't ever have to do that. A healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity. Look what he says, until we reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing in the maturity with stature measured by Christ's fullness, then we will no longer be little children tossed around by way, by the tossed around, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. You know what I learned in COVID? That people would say COVID was the worst season of life. It was my greatest season of discipleship. I sat at my back window, looked out at my backyard, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. A couple of things the Lord said to me was pretty powerful. The Lord revealed to me during the COVID season that we were in a wilderness season. If you study the word wilderness, it means that we're in a season of pause. The word wilderness, actually, if you look at it defined, is the voice of God. God brings us into the wilderness so we can hear his voice. I mean, if you know the children of Israel had to die there, a lot of them, but a lot of them got corrected there and then got to go and take the promised land, Joshua being one of those. The other thing the Lord showed me was that I needed to be very careful what I listen to and who I listen to. Here's how I know what I'm about to tell you is true. What I learned during the COVID season is how spiritually and biblically illiterate the church is. Because the group of people in the moment to shine the best, one word or group of words defined who we were. And here's what it was. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I got guys today still blaming what's going on in their situation on COVID. Can I just say this and somebody say amen? COVID and all of that garbage is not more powerful than God. It's not going to stop the church. It's not going to stop the mission of Jesus. It's not going to stop us from reaching people. The fact of the matter is, what it will do is give us a really good excuse of being lazy and not leading and not carrying the vision of God and not reaching our communities and just saying out loud, well, it's its fault. In this world today, do you understand that in our moment to shine the moment, the most when there should have been a group of people that acted like they knew they had it all together because they had been given instruction before there had been any kind of trouble in their life. We didn't have to look for instruction, Ron, during that time. We had been given instruction. It's called the Word of God. And things weren't falling apart. They were coming together according to His will. And He told us exactly what to do in that moment. And we did it. And we were blown around by every whim of doctrine. I was having people come into church. You better, have you been listening to so-and-so? They've got the scoop. They know what's going on. They said we should listen at 3 o'clock at, to this radio station because we're going to get a word. And I said, I just want you to understand something. I don't care what that guy says at 3 o'clock because at 2 o'clock this morning, I got a word. And the king of glory said to me, Keep marching forward 
Keep preaching Jesus. Stay the course. If everything's falling around you by the wayside, you are mature in your walk to understand it's my voice you followed before you got here. It's going to be my voice you follow while you're here and once you're past here. And I want you to understand something. We're on the other side of it and we all got to follow the king and listen to his voice and he let us come through on dry ground and we're okay today. Better yet, your church, I know you probably don't hear these numbers much, but I'm going to say them. How much did you grow during the, that season? How big did your church grow during it? 200%. Yeah. It's a little better than 50. Can I tell you something? This is the second thing I feel like, the first thing I wanted you to understand is I feel like strongly... Matter of fact, Pastor Stephen gave me permission because I wasn't going to say anything, but I really felt strongly that I, I sense a brother who's got an apostolic calling. And you guys can get into that and figure out he's going to have to really walk in it and see what the Lord says. And that is, I mean, he's leaving. It actually means he's going to actually be more active in the mission of this church than ever. I'm more engaged in mission city than I've ever been. The second thing I feel strongly to tell you, some of y'all may not remember this, but a couple... About 10 years ago, I stood in this same spot with my pastor, Heath Davis, and one other gentleman, and we sat here, and this room was completely a shell, and this place had never been remodeled or finished. It got to a point and stopped. And I remember him saying to us that moment, before James Walker ever got the opportunity, or anybody else, hey, I don't feel like I've got vision. I want to give this place to somebody that's got vision. And in my heart, I was going, let's take it. Let's take it. Let's take it. Let's take it. Take it now. But in my immaturity, I didn't realize that the Lord was doing a work in me while I was trying to do my thing. And what I didn't realize is if had we had taken this spot, A, it wasn't supposed to be that, but B, God wanted to actually send us to Vermont to start a church, not to remodel one in, in, in Boston, North Carolina. But now I'm standing in this place and have the, I've had the opportunity two weekends almost in a row as filled up as it can get and I am learning one thing and it's very clear to me. I've said this now over the last few weeks. I've spoken to a lot of pastors in a lot of places even to our own church. I want you to hear me say this. Lean in and hear me say this. Do not miss what I'm about to tell you. If you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to hear me say this. I believe that the Holy Spirit clearly has laid in my heart to tell this to you so I'm saying it today that you have the opportunity to be one of the largest movements of God this county ever seen if you will stay out of the way. Amen. And you'll keep Jesus as king and you'll be obedient to just play your part and own your responsibility and you won't have to let your staff and pastors beg you to serve but you will serve because you have been gifted by a generous God who is king. And you will pat your pastor on the back and say, I'm praying as you go and do what the Lord is calling you to do on behalf of our church and the mission of Jesus. And he will begin to tell you stories of amazing things like, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than you could ever think or ask for through Christ at work in him. There's going to be stories written about what's going on here, I'm telling you. And I'm just glad I got to be here at one moment in the venture to say I got to hang out with them for a minute. But maturity says it's not about us. Maturity says it's about us being obedient with the gifts that we've been given. And maturity says we will get our orders from this book. What we will say is as we make decisions, as we go through difficulties, as we go through hardships, our very answer will be, thus saith the word of the Lord. Amen. And if you're not a person of the word, can I tell you what one of my spiritual fathers told me as I sat on the side of the road scared to death this last year when I talked to him and said, Pastor Jonathan, I feel like the Lord is calling me to be a part of Mission City Church, but also to be in more of a role of moving about and I was scared to death and thought people were going to leave and they didn't like me and, and I, they thought I was crazy and they, some of the people still may do that. He looked at me and he said, the two things I will tell you in this, he said, the Lord told me a long time ago, 
Jonathan, I'm going to put you in a place the rest of your life where you'll never be comfortable. Pastor Stephen, I want you to hear me say this. As a brother who's just a little farther ahead down the road, the journey ahead is not going to be comfortable. But the Lord in that season is going to make you okay with being uncomfortable. The second thing Pastor Jonathan told me, and this is a man who started a church in Boston when there was no church planting, and his church before he retired had 65 nationalities in it and over 2,000 people. One of my closest spiritual fathers. Not even a part of our Southern Baptist tribe. I didn't care. Sometimes you got to go to the charismatic to get you a good word from the Lord. <laughs> and Pastor Jonathan said this very boldly on that phone call. He said what I'm about to say to you. Be people of the word and prayer because if you don't you might gather some people and you might even get big and people might even know your name but if it doesn't point them to King Jesus everything you have done and do is in vain there's this verse that I was told back when I was a youth pastor and I walked into a group we had about 200 teenagers at the time and went to one Thursday night or Wednesday night youth thing and there was only a few students in the room and I remember I said it to one of my older uh, leaders in our seasoned leaders in our ministry team and I said where is everybody and he gave me a passage of scripture and he said when you get home just read it and I about forgot about it and I sat down and I could say so much more about this chapter and verse there's so much more I want to say I just haven't got time I feel like I've said what the Lord wanted me to say to you and anyhow, I got home and I read this scripture, and the scripture he shared with me, I wish I could remember the exact, some of you will be able to say it as soon as I say it, I can't think right now. But the scripture is, unless the Lord builds the house, all the work is in vain. And I long for the day that we hear in the church, and the Lord added to the church daily, those who, who should be saved. Daily. Listen, Orchard Church. It's a real juncture in the road here. You can decide either to stand on one side of the Jordan and make a tent and hang out there, and that's great. Or you can decide, I'm going to go across. And we're going to begin to inherit the land that the Lord already owns. I've talked to a lot of pastors in Haywood County, and one of the things I'm seeing scares me to death. I'm listening to the stories of the declining of the church. This is very, very scary. Churches that once had hundreds now have 20. And pastors saying, I don't know what to do. 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 And what I want to say to them is, Pastor, man, seek God and get the vision of God and then lead. There's going to be moments in the future that you're going to have opportunities to be a parent to the parent, the ones who need parenting. Take them. But also, I feel very strongly to say this, and I'll be here. I'll hush after this. Stephen, I'm sorry. You are not just a church that revitalizes churches. I think you're a church that can plant churches in places where there are no churches. Believe it or not, there are still places. There are no churches. In the northeast kingdom of Vermont, if someone in that area wanted to hear the gospel, it would be virtually impossible unless they tuned into a TV channel on a day. Not on my watch. We're going to try our best to fill that place. We've got a strategy for Vermont. If we can plant a church within 30 minutes driving distance of all of Vermont, then we can reach 98% of the people in Vermont potential. 620,000 people in Vermont and only 20,000 claim any kind of walk with the Lord. So that means over a half a million people could essentially die and go to hell today. I don't know about you, but for me, that's not good. Amen. But I'm telling you this right now. I want you to hear me say this. If the South doesn't watch it, it will be a reflection of the North in just a few short years. We'll be hearing stories of saying, hey, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, it's, it's the most unreached place in the region. And if you don't believe that's true, you come live with us for a few days and you'll see what that looks like. It's true, right, Jay? Orchard, I love you. I don't know you that well, but I love you. I hope I get to come back and hang out with you. I know your pastor's coming up hang out with us, and I'm going to let him go at it to our people. And um, I'm praying for you. I'm trying to sense what the Lord wants me to do, and I feel a couple of things, if it's okay. The first thing I want to do is there's always two crowds of people in a room I want to talk to, and I could tell you to bow your head. I'm not even going to do that today. Can I just look at you to your face and say, if you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus today. 
If you've never given your life to Christ, you need Christ today. Your greatest need is not another message or a good song or a meal after church. You need Jesus today. Come to Jesus. He desires to come to your house. He desires to change your life. He desires for you not to live hopeless and struggling and feeling like you want to end it. He wants you to know that he came that you could have life and have it more abundantly. Do you know him today? Because if you don't, you can. And I wonder right where you are if you understood this very simple pre- 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 truth that you were born broken. There was two things. It was your disobedience and your rebellion that caused you to sin. And because you were disobedient and rebellious, you sinned. You and I did what was against the Father, what was sinful. And because of that, a holy God could not be in the presence of disobedient, rebellious people. And so we were separated from God in a vast chasm that was unobtainable for us to get across the chasm on our own. But God in his love and his mercy sent Jesus to this earth. He came to this earth, he died on a cross, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day in a borrowed tomb, he was dead and then came back to life, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the one who knew no sin became sin for the sinful so that the sinful could be declared righteous in him. And so today, just like this sister's testimony today, can I ask you a question, sister? Is Jesus worth it? Is is Jesus worth it? Is he just the knowing him today? Has it just made your life just, it's worth it, isn't it? If you could tell everybody in this room that maybe don't know Christ, would you agree with me? Would you say on this stage, if you come again, come to Jesus today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait 16 years. He's He's just waiting. Come today. Now listen, this is awkward and unconventional, and if I do this wrong, then I'm, I'll go ride my motorcycle to lunch wrong. But if you've never given your life to Christ in this room right now, I want you to hear me say this. Today's the day. I wonder if you would just honestly say, I want to give my life to Christ just like this sister did. I need Jesus. Just put your hand up right now. I need Jesus. Anybody bold enough to do that? With everybody looking? Maybe there's no one in here. I need Jesus. I have learned this, that every big faith step should feel like you got a gulp. I'm going to say it one more time, that's done. That's just what I feel like the Lord wants me to do. Stephen, I hope you don't hate me for this. I need Jesus right now, Pastor. I want to give my life to Christ today. I don't care who knows it. I don't want to wait anymore. Anybody? I feel like the Lord's saying this to somebody. One, two, three, I need Jesus. Anybody in this room? I want to pray for you. And we'll go on. Maybe you're here and you didn't raise your hand. Not that the hand raising does anything, but I just, man, I like to know. I wonder if you're sitting in this room and you dishonestly say, Father, I'm a sinner. I've been disobedient, rebellious, and I want you to come into my life. I want you to change me. And to the best of my days, to the best of my ability, for the rest of my days, I want to make you king. And Lord, will you teach me? I turn from my disobedience and rebellion, and I, to the best of my ability, for the rest of my days, walk to follow you. I'm yours. If you just prayed that, I want you to understand the Bible says for everyone who calls on his name, you are saved. Doesn't mean you got it figured out. Salvation is a starting point. We have to learn what it looks like to make someone king of our life. If that's you, you just prayed that. Before you leave, we're going to have some people down here. I want you to come talk to them. They're going to want to encourage you. Let them encourage you in the Lord. Here's the last thing. I want to look you straight in your face. Orchard, you want to be a big church or you want to be a healthy church? Because there's a definitive difference. A health, healthy church doesn't want to just get big. They want to go broad. But they want to do what it takes. Jesus is king. My gift is essential. And my maturity is important. I want to do something today. I don't know how to do it. So I'm just going to do it. I want to pray over your pastor. And I don't even know who to call up to help me pray over your pastor. Maybe your deacons and your elders or pastors. I don't know. But the rest of you can point your hand this way. But I just want to pray over him as he leads this mission because the one who carries the most responsibility is he. 
and it's very hard. And he didn't ask me to do this and may not like it when we go to lunch. But I'm a big boy. I can handle it. So, Pastor, come on up here. Come up to the stage. And deacons, elders, if you're in the room, I don't know who you are. Can you come with me? I want somebody to help me lay hands on this brother. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. How many of you would just love to join and just put your hand towards your pastor? How many of you are thankful for your pastor? Come on. I want to do two things. I want to see anybody that would be on. Now, listen, if you're not honest, you're just going to sit and own your stuff. <laughs> Sorry, this is the way I talk. Oh, this is not this is me on stage. Honey, is this me on stage? This is me everywhere. So my wife always has this caveat every time. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. Amen. And uh, anybody, any ladies got that husband in the house? You know what I'm talking about. But anybody in this room, because I want our pastor to see this, anybody in this room that says, Pastor, we want to walk as healthy as we can, and we want you to fulfill the calling of God on our behalf in this church as our leader, we support the mission of Jesus in this place, and we want you to see Jesus as king, our gifts are essential, and my maturity is important. Would you just stand and join me? I want you to see this, bro. And then I want anybody who feels comfortable, just raise your hand forward as we all lay hands on your pastor. Father, in Jesus' name, we call on you because we believe that you are King and Lord. And we ask you today, as we once again commission and send out missionaries into a field, we commission all these people in this room today to walk in their calling, to receive their gifts, to, to focus on maturity, to be in community with each other so they can learn, to show up for leadership events, to let the world know that we're not playing games. Would you use this body to do and be a part of a movement that this county talks about in the history books? We commission this pastor together to walk in the apostolic calling that he feels, God, you're stirring up in his heart. We pray for peace and freedom over everyone in this room. You would let us walk in that, and you would let us function in that. And God, you would open doors. We pray for brothers and sisters in this room to step up and take leadership roles that they've been playing around wondering whether they should or shouldn't. We pray that you'll call out pastors and elders in this room. We'll call out campus pastors and leaders in this room to lift and hold up the arms and to fulfill spots and places. We pray for space in this county that this church can either build here or move from here and go build somewhere else. Help us never get married to a building or a place. God, help us understand this beautiful building's a tool, but it ain't that important, God. What's important is the mission of Jesus, and wherever we got to go to do that, we want to do that. We trust you for a lot of money and resources to fulfill the mission that you've called us to be a part of. We ask you, Lord, together we pray this, unified together. I pray for this in Mission City Church. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give you praise. Lord, let us mark this day down in our calendars, never to forget it. That this is the day that we decided once again we're going to be as healthy as we can so we can see the Lord add to the church daily. That should be said. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want somebody to celebrate like it's 1999. <laughs> Pastor Tim, um, I want to I want to thank you so much, man, uh, for both of your messages today. Yes, <laughs> so funny. Yes. <laughs> Tell somebody no. to go back and listen to the second one. Listen. That's right. No, I, thank you, thank you, church. Thank you for your, your blessing and and the encouragement. But more than that, thank you for your yes, because that's what's going to take. It's going to take all of us. Amen. We are on the precipice. We are at we are at a point where a decision has got to be made. Are we going to say yes and step out in faith? Or are we comfortable? Listen, I'll, I have complete freedom to say this. If you're okay being comfortable, I'm out. That's not a threat. It's just a reality. Because I want to do what Jesus wants us to do. And I want us to step out in faith and watch God provide. And I want us to impact this community 
for Jesus Christ in a way that it has never been impacted. And I'm excited to be able to lock arms with every single one of you and do it. Regardless of where you are in the journey, let's do it. Let's do it. If today is the day, uh, I know you're hungry. I know that. I am too. Um, but if, you, if today is the day you say, you know what, my yes is on the table and, and, and I want to join this church. I want to become a member of the Orchard Church today. Do it. To represent what, what you are saying you're committing to. We're going to have some encouragers and some pastors and ministers up here. We can start that conversation with you. If you say, you know what, I need a little more information about the church. Register for the membership class. It's August the 28th during the first service hour. August the 28th. So that's two Sundays from now. Three Sundays from now. I don't even know what day it is anymore. <laughs> August 28th. I know it's that. But come and you can register. Let us know you're going to come. And we'd love to be able to, to talk. But you don't have to wait to take that class to join the church. And then um, next week. Thank you, Tim, for saying that. Every one of you after this service next week. And we'll be done about 12 next week, I promise you. Because we're going to have that leadership rally. But I'd love for all of us to leave here and go to the leadership rally. And that rally is we're going to tell you God's stories of what Jesus has done because of your ministry of the gospel through this church. And we're going to do some training, but it's going to be, it's going to be small. Most of your training is going to happen online later throughout the week through videos that we have prepared and worked for months so that all that training can be taken, take place somewhere else. But I love you, church. I'm thankful for you. Are you excited about what God's doing? Come on. Come on. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you.